back with you for lesson number nine in the fourth chapter of our study in the book of James. And I am delighted today that you have chosen to join us. And whether you're watching this video down in Florida or whether you're looking at it on, uh, <clears throat> on YouTube, I'm just so honored that you would take the time uh, to join us as we seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as we try our best to do an exegetical study of Scripture, that means drawing out the truths of the Word of God in order then to apply those things to our lives because we truly want to be the person that God wants us to be. <clears throat> and so today I just want to remind all of us that we are all engaged every single day in a spiritual war. And Paul reminds us over in Ephesians chapter 6 that we're to put on the whole armor of God. And so I encourage you to go to Ephesians chapter 6 and, and to review again what Paul says about clothing ourselves in the armor of God for a specific purpose, and that is in order to stand against the schemes of the devil. So I just want to say a word of encouragement this morning as well, and that is this. You know, all of us struggle. We're all broken. And from time to time, the devil is always coming along and he's accusing us, uh, reminding us of our past failures. And I just want to encourage you today and to just simply say, listen, I understand that I have fallen, that I've messed up, that I am broken. But you know, on the cross, Jesus paid the price for all of our mistakes, for all of our sin, for all of our brokenness, for all of eternity. And so today I just challenge you to walk in the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for me and you. He loves us beyond our ability to comprehend or to understand. And so don't let, the, don't let Satan, don't let the world cast aspersions upon you. You are a born-again child of God if you've put your faith and trust in Him. Christ washed away all of our sins, and today we can walk in freedom because of whose we are. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time. May these next few moments be profitable for the kingdom. Would you bless and keep every single person who views this video, and may you encourage them with who you are, and may your presence fill our lives as we surrender our will to thine. And Lord, may the Holy Spirit of God guide and direct our thoughts, our words, our actions, and may we simply be a shining example of what Christ can do in the life of a person who gives themselves to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, today we are going to <clears throat> simply attempt to uh, encompass the verses of of, of uh, James chapter 4. And <clears throat> I got to tell you, I'm being so blessed uh, in this study, and I pray that you are as well. But today, as we get into this, uh, a very strong, these very strong words from James, I want to start by simply saying this. As we get into the text, you're going to see this over and over. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. <clears throat> James is going to talk about some things that deal with, with our heart issues. And so we're going to begin, like we always do, I'm going to read the, these verses of, of Scripture to you, and then we're going to kind of break these verses down, 17 um, verses of Scripture here in this passage. And I do this because I want you to kind of get the big picture, then, we're going to come, then we come back and we kind of break it down and put some application to it in some better understanding. So James begins by saying, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covenant, or covet rather, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of God becomes an enemy, or friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? God opposes the proud, but gives favor, or shows favor, <clears throat> excuse me, to the humble. Submit yourselves then to, the, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, and come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. 
Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister urges or judge that brother or sister judges them speaks against the law and judges it. And when you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment upon it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not, do, why, do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? <laughs> Man, nobody knows that. Uh, what is your life, he says? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes and all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do it and doesn't do it, it is for them sin. Now in these 17 verses, one of the things that becomes very clear to us is that there are some serious issues taking place among the body uh, of believers and James is writing to address these. Now once again, I just want to remind you, uh, some people jump into Bible study a little later and they've not been with us from the very beginning. This is the half brother of Jesus writing from the city of Jerusalem to those <clears throat> who have been scattered abroad by persecution that broke out against them in Jerusalem. And so here they have now established a church, a synagogue, the body of Christ, if you please, and there are issues and James is writing a letter uh, it's not a book, it's a personal letter that is to be read um, to uh, the believers as they gather together. And he's addressing issues and obviously talk is coming back to him. He's learning of issues and problems there. And so James is writing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, <clears throat> to simply try to bring correction and direction to these believers who are struggling with some of these issues. And so I want to talk first of all about the picture of the problem in verses one through four. And I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have a notepad and you're taking notes. And then secondly, I want to talk about the prescription for the problem in verses seven through 12, and then we'll wrap it up in those final verses. And so first of all, let's jump in and talk about the picture of the problem in verses one through four. Here's what James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And so then, so the picture of the problem presents us really with two causes. First of all, there are inner desires. So he says, what causes fights and quarrels? Don't they, be, don't they come from your desires that are within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Now, it's clear that cause number one <clears throat> of the problem is wanting something or things that we don't have. One of the great tragedies of the world in which we live in is that we can never seem to garner enough. You know, the question that sometimes uh, Sandra and I have discussed in days past is just really, you know, when is enough enough? because things fill the world. You know, we were talking the other day, we were kind of do some, we're doing some cleaning out and rearranging and so forth and giving some things away. Uh, but we were just talking about the fact that when I was a kid growing up and likewise the same for her, you know, in our house, the house we lived in had a very small little closet. And why was that? Because we didn't have a lot of clothes. I had a school clothes and I had Sunday clothes. And that was it. And it didn't take very much room to put those things in there. I had one pair of Sunday shoes and I had another pair of shoes that I wore to school. Today, we are, we are so, we have so much. It's unbelievable all the things that we have. And yet we still get the wandering eye thinking, well, I, I'd, I'd really like to have that. I'd like to have this. And, and we all struggle with it. Listen, there's not anybody that doesn't. We live in a, in a materialistic society and culture. And I want to use the illustration of Buddhism. As you know, I've studied world religions and so forth. But one of the things about Buddhists is that they teach and believe that unhappiness stems from desiring things that you cannot have. Now, you know, back in the Vietnam War when our soldiers, our men were fighting there, one of the things they discovered was they tried to say to the Buddhists, you know, if you'll help us against the enemies, we'll give you a bigger house or a bigger hut or whatever the case may be, or we'll give you more of this or more of that. And they just simply said, no, we, we have enough. They didn't realize how 
the, how, how to approach people because with a Western mindset, things did not appeal to those particular people. And so here we are in our world today, and James is saying all the way back to the first century, he's writing, hey guys, the quarrels and the fightings that are taking place among you, not only is it ungodly, number one, but number two, it's all because you desire things that you can't have, and then, and then you turn right around and, and you pray about things, but the reason you don't get those things from God, the reason that God does not meet your need is because you're gonna lavish it upon yourself. You're not gonna use it for the kingdom's sake. I wanna repeat once again, God created us to be givers. God works through us. He makes us channels of blessing. He pours into our lives. He says, if you have a need, you come to me and I'll meet that need according to my glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And yet he doesn't intend for us to stop it up here, but to outflow. You know, one of the reasons the Dead Sea is dead in Israel is because there's no outlet. The Jordan River flows from the mountains up in the northern part of Israel, 200 miles all the way down <clears throat> to the Dead Sea, but there's no outlet. And when there's no outlet, things become stagnant and it dies. And that's exactly what happens with us when we refuse to be the channel that God intended for us to be. And so here James is dealing with this issue. And so while that is the desire, there are many consequences to this situation, and they're found in verses two and three. He said, what happens is you have murderous thoughts and words, that is harsh words, arguments, and, and failure to pray. And then he goes on to say, you have murderous, murderous thoughts. I'm gonna kill that person because you know, blah, blah, blah. They have something I want. Words, arguments, failure to pray, praying with wrong motives in verse number three. And so these are causes these are consequences, rather, of the cause of desiring things that we do not have. But what's cause number two? Well, James moves from the things to, the, rather, that uh, not getting the things we want, to cause number two is loving the world in verse four, because he goes on to say, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God, and therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God? Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? So he goes on to say here in Exodus 34 verse 14, and this is really important. God, we're told, is a jealous God. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. And of course in context, uh, the Lord is speaking through Moses to the, 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 the people in the Exodus that have come out of Egypt. But he wants them to know that he is a jealous God. He, want, he created us for him and he wants to live in us and through us. And so have you noticed from <clears throat> previous studies that we've uh, been in and things that we've talked about, what a hindrance things, and I capped a lot, things are to our spiritual lives. <clears throat> John warns us over in 1 John 2 verse 15, and we've talked about this so many times before, do not emphatically, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So John points out the seriousness of us loving things in the world because it's things are temporal, it's people that are eternal. And God wants us to have the right perspective. And James is writing this because this is, first of all, causing not only dissension within the body of Christ, but it is destroying the reputation outside the body of Christ because people are looking at this. And by the way, same thing happens today. We've talked about this before. The devil loves to start, he'd rather start a church fight than sell, sell a thousand barrels of booze. I mean, nothing detracts from the love of Jesus and the gospel of Christ than does problems and dissension, people angry and bitter and so forth in a church. And so many times as we've said, it's just because they don't get what they want. Paul exhorts us over in Colossians chapter three, as James is thinking about all this, since then, Paul says, you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, you know, it came to my mind just as I'm sharing this with you. And let me just see if I can pull up something real quickly here 
<clears throat> from my own uh, some notes that I've made in my script in, in my Bible. There's something that just came to my mind, <clears throat> and I want to just uh, take a moment. And if I can lay my hands on it real quick, like I want to share it with you because uh, it, it just dawned on me that uh, this would be, would have been something that I would have liked to have included in my, uh, my, my message today for us all. And it has to do with the five crowns that we're going to receive in heaven. I can't uh, really lay my hands on it at the moment. But let me just say this. God wants us to have the big picture, the eternal look, not the, and not focus on the temporary. And this, I, I think this is so important. And one of the reasons is because we talked about it here just last week about the judgment seat of Christ, how we're going to stand one day before the Lord and he's going to evaluate the things we have done and, 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 the, and the reasons that we have done them and so forth and so on. And so uh, the bottom line is, is that it is having the big picture, the long view, and not those things that are temporary and, and on the short sighted. So here are five crowns that scripture says that we will receive. First of all, there's the incorruptible crown. There's a crown of life. There's a crown of glory. There's a crown of righteousness. And there's a crown of rejoicing. And, uh, and so these are five different crowns. And we, don't, we won't go into the, to the, the, the scripture references today. But I just throw that in because it came to my mind here as I was sharing this. Is that, is that we don't want to focus on the earthly things. For Christ died and now my life, your life, is hidden with Christ in God. This is the big picture. This is the long view as opposed to looking at the temporal, which is a short one. So let me repeat this truth. You will possess things or things will possess you. So we've seen this happen so many, many times. You know, there's nothing wrong with things. God blesses us. He gives us to us. He, he answers prayer according to his will. And so we have things, we have stuff, but stuff should never dominate our lives because these things, either we will possess them or they will dominate or possess our lives. I had a friend of mine who was a very dear friend. He was uh, <clears throat> an, a, uh, an allergist uh, up in Northwest Arkansas. And we were part of, a, of something called the, an impact team when I was up at University Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so we would travel throughout Northwest Arkansas, Southeastern Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera. And we would do a big Saturday gathering and then a Sunday service and so forth. But our primary focus was, uh, was trying to reach men and talking to men about their lives and encouraging them to stand up and be true men that God could use to glorify himself and to be a husband to a wife and to a father to the children and so forth. And what it would mean to get their prior, get our priorities as men, you know, in, in order uh, with God first and family second. And then, the, then we're third on that list. And far too many times <clears throat> we get that divine order out of divine order. And we forget what really life is really all about. It is not in the accumulation of stuff. But having said that, <clears throat> my friend was a pilot and he bought this beautiful uh, Beechcraft Baron twin engine aircraft and I used to fly with him a great deal in fact that's how I started ended up flying was I started flying with him on at these meetings and so forth and later went on through pilot training myself and I've had numbers a number of different airplanes through the years <clears throat> and God has blessed us with being able to to do that in the past but having said all that one day he said to me I put I want you to know something I put my airplane up for sale and I said, really, why? You haven't had it but a few weeks. And he said, I know. But he said, you know, Gary, I feel like that my priorities are out of order. I, I, I love this airplane so much. And, and in my prayer time the other day, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I know that you love that airplane, but I want you to sell it. And I thought, but Lord, why, why, would, I want to, why would I do that? Why would you put that burden on my heart to sell it? But, you know, God realized something was going on in his heart that that airplane was far more important than it should have been. And in an act of obedience to God, he put the airplane up for sale. And uh, in a matter of hours, someone bought that airplane. And so uh, weeks went by and <clears throat> next time I was with him, he said, <clears throat> Gary, I want you to know that uh, I have my airplane back. And I said, what? And he said, 
I realized that God put me to the test. He wanted to make sure that I loved him more than I cared about that piece of metal out there. And he said, so I put it up and sure enough, it sold. And not long after that, he said, God began to speak to my heart and say to me, because you've been obedient, then I'm going to let you have your airplane back. And he said, I bought the airplane back. Now, it cost me a few thousand dollars more than I had sold it for, but I got it back. And he said, I, have, I feel like now that I can handle it, that now it's in the proper, my, my life is in its proper divine order. Folks, listen again, I just, want, <clears throat> I just want to say to you, it's okay to have things. It's all right, as long as the things don't have you. So I would ask that as you watch this video today, or whenever you see this, that you would sit down and take an inventory of your own personal life. Are things in the proper order in your life? Are you in love with, and by the way, when I talk about things, I, I, I don't mean to, to leave out certain elements. Here's one of the things that's important. It's not just material stuff. Sometimes it's a person in your life that you have elevated to a position higher than that should be. You know, God is always number one. He is sovereign. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He should have the priority in my life, in your life. He should never be in a second place. Nothing should ever usurp that. Sometimes a marital relationship, sometimes children, sometimes grandchildren can become far more important to an individual than their personal relationship with Christ. That's a real danger zone for us. And so I would just ask you to take an inventory, a spiritual inventory of your life, and just make sure that our priorities, mine and yours both, are in the proper order. Now, having said that, <clears throat> I will say this. In most cases, instead of possessing things or things possessing you, and in most cases, it's the latter that they tend to possess us. Now, so the picture of the problem is things, stuff, uh, it is quarreling and fighting because we want things we don't have and so forth. And this causes all types of issues within the body of Christ. But then secondly, what's the prescription for the problem in verses 7 through 12? James writes this. He says this, submit yourselves then to God. So here's the answer to the issue. Give yourself wholly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and God will come near to you. Listen, God is not far away. He is living within us, but, he, but sometimes we squeeze him into a little box and he's not on the throne of our life. And we need to pause every morning and simply say, God, today I just want you to, you take the rightful possession of my life because I belong for you. You bought and paid for me. I am yours. You are sovereign. You are king. You are the Lord of my life. And I want you to be in total complete control. And so draw near to God. And when you do, he will be near to you. You wash your hands, your sinners, James says. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them uh, or judges them, speaks against the law and judges the law. And when you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment upon it. And James reminds them there's only one lawgiver and, a, and judge, and that's the one who's able to save you and who is able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So I, ran, I made a little list, and I want to share it with you. First of all, submit yourselves to God. Here's the prescription. Second, resist the devil. He says and he'll, he'll flee from you. Come near to God, he says, thirdly, and God will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, he says. Purify your hearts. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Now, I'm going to stop here for a moment. One of the things that I see in my own observations today is that we rarely grieve and mourn over our own personal sinfulness. You know, when I'm preaching in churches and it comes time to give an invitation to invite people to A, commit their lives to Christ, or B, to repent of sins and restore themselves and allow the Lord to restore them to a proper relationship. One of the things that I harp on is this, there must be repentance. Now, we've talked about repentance being a word that simply means to have a change of direction. But you see, I see people who want to make emotional decisions. At that moment in time, they become very emotional and they're, they're kind of sorry for their sin. Well, let me just tell you, Judas Iscariot was sorry for the fact that he sold out the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. But that didn't mean he repented. It didn't mean he got right with God. 
One of the things that concerns me is, is that we should, when we sin against the Lord, it should hurt us. It hurts the Father, but it should hurt us. We should grieve in the sense that I have sinned against the one who loves me, the one who gave his life for me. And the result of that can be in private. And as James is writing, mourn, he says, over your sin. Even wail if, need, if, 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 it, if it comes to that. But the point is, we need to take sin seriously. You see, all sin is against the Lord God himself. And we need to be confessing and repenting that sin and turning away from it. So seven, he says, change your laughter uh, into sorrow and so forth. Verse eight, humble yourselves before the Lord. And then lastly, he says, do not slander your neighbor, your friend, your brother. Slander is making accusations and things that are not true. There are things and times when we need to evaluate in order to better help someone to be restored in fellowship to the Lord, but we do not slander, nor do we, nor do we rail against the mercy and the goodness of the Lord. So James wraps up this section by saying in verses 13 and 14, don't boast about tomorrow because your life is but a mist. In, in, verse, in, in verse 16, he says, all boasting is evil. So as James writes this letter, he's saying, some of you are saying, well, tomorrow I will go to such and such city and there I will do business and I'll, or I'll, I'll stay a year and I'll do business and I'll make money. And, and the Lord says, What's, have you forgotten that your life is but a mist, a vapor? You're here one moment and gone the next. You know, you know we're only, listen carefully. I hope you listen to this. All of us are only one breath away from eternity. One breath, that's all. That's how fragile our lives are. And so I would just simply say, we don't have a right to boast about today or tomorrow or what's going to happen because we don't know. We have no earthly idea if we will see the sun go down today, let alone the sun rise tomorrow. We have no idea because we are like the flowers of the field, here today and gone tomorrow. Do you realize how little time we really have on this earth? You know, if we live to be 70, which would be a blessing, 80, 90, whatever the case may be, that's such a smidgen of time compared to eternity. Just think about this. We're here for a brief while. We get an opportunity to serve the Lord and to be, be pleasing to Him and to, to share the love of God with others. But soon our days will come to an end. And if Jesus comes and the, when the trumpet sounds uh, to call His bride to heaven, which I believe is going to occur soon, I'm ready for that. But you know, I want to make every day profitable for the kingdom of God. I want to make sure that my priorities are in order. And I simply am not boasting about tomorrow because I have no idea what tomorrow may bring. Remember what we said before. Today is all we have. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. We have no idea. Today is what we have. Today is what we have. That's why we make every day count. And so he says, don't boast about the fact of what you're going to do because all boasting is evil because you don't know. And then he says, do say this, if it, is the, if it is the Lord's will. And, you know, I've gotten to where I say that more often these days as I've gotten older, and that is, you know, Lord willing, uh, we're going to do this. Lord willing, we're going to do that. But it's only as if it is in accordance with the will of God, because none of us know about tomorrow. And so, verse 17, James wraps this up by saying, <clears throat> if you know what you ought to do and you don't do it, then you sin. So it's not about not doing, you know, sometimes uh, I think preachers and teachers get on the, what I would call the negative side of the gospel and everything is about the don'ts. Uh, but the Bible's full of do's. It, it's, it, it's not about a set of rules and, and, and laws. It, it, it's about doing because we have been forgiven. And that frees us up to live a glorious life in light of we are the fact that we're the children of God. But here's the thing. So it's not just about what you don't do. If you know something is right, and if God puts it in your heart to do it, then if you don't obey, you've sinned against God. That's like my friend with the airplane. God put it in his heart and told him in his own spirit. He said, you know, you need to get rid of this because the priorities is out of order. You love this thing more than you love me. You've given it a place of preeminence in your life. So he knew what he needed to do and he did it. 
And had he not done that, for him it would have been sin. And so the bottom line here is this. If you know what you ought to do, and then you don't do it, now you're in a state of rebellion, and you have sinned against the Lord. Well, this is uh, kind of a whirlwind little journey through James chapter 4. It's our, our what did I say, ninth or tenth lesson here, I guess it is, in this study. <clears throat> and, uh, and I know this, I have been so blessed uh, with uh, my time to study and prepare to share with you. You know, I, my prayer, even this day, this morning in fact, was that, Lord, I, I don't want to just be a teacher or a preacher who says something, who just gets up and talks. If God is not anointing me and his word, then this is all futile. But I know as much as I can be right now, I say this to you all, I'm clean before the Lord as much as I know how to be. I am a servant. I, my prayer is, Lord, search me and know my heart, know my thoughts, and see if there wouldn't be any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way of the everlasting. And so the Holy Spirit of God shines his light in my heart, and if there's something there that's not right, God speaks to me about that, and I'll always do my best to repent of that and agree with God that I'm wrong and he is right, and I challenge you to do the same thing. So bless you these next few days. Bless you every day, and uh, hopefully... We'll be together again uh, soon as we go to the last and final chapter in this little letter from James, chapter 5. God bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you until he comes. God bless.